Hello teachers, let's talk about section 11-4, Geometry in Three Dimensions. Hopefully when you finish this section, you will have an understanding of simple closed surfaces and polyhedra, how to draw three-dimensional shapes, or at least how to understand drawings of three-dimensional shapes, why there are only five regular polyhedra and simple closed surfaces that are not polyhedra. Okay, so first let's define simple closed surface. Has exactly one interior, no holes, and is hollow. So again, that is a simple closed surface. Notice all four of these figures listed here fit that description. There's only one interior in this triangle shaped situation right here. Only one interior here. This is actually a pyramid. Here is a sphere. Only one interior there, and here is a cone. It's an oblique cone. Now, the figures below, the bottom two, are not simple closed surfaces. Why would you say they're not? Okay. Now, I would argue on this first one, there appears to be a hole. And let's, point, let's go ahead and point something out about looking at these figures. Whenever you see the dashed line, that means that is hidden. So what you see visually is the non-dashed line. If you were to look at a three-dimensional object just like this, you would not see this dashed line or this dashed line. So anything that you see dashed is really hidden, and it's just implying that that's what the figure looks like, but you can't actually see that. And so you see here, we see the one, two, three faces, but back there, there's a fourth face, and then there's the the shape at the bottom. Okay, that's called the base. Uh, again, a sphere over here, you don't really see the back side of the sphere, but that's implying that that dimension is back there. And same thing with this cylinder shape here. Okay, so the dash lines mean that we really wouldn't see that if that was a real three dimensional figure in front of us but it's given us the idea of the shape that's going on. And so when I look down here, you know, you can't, we're not really looking at this. This appears to be like a cube shape, right? But the problem is it's got a big hole in it. All of that is a hole, and that's not allowed in a simple closed surface. What do you think's wrong with the second figure? It's not simple, right? Remember the idea of simple was defined in a previous section, and simple means it doesn't cross itself. So if we were to trace this out, or even if it was two-dimensional, this figure would cross over itself, therefore not simple. A sphere, you know, the definition of a sphere is the set of all points at a given distance from a given point, the center. That sounds just like the definition of a circle, right? But you're talking about in space. So you can go in every single direction from a single point, and that's going to define a sphere for you. What's a solid? Well, a solid is the set of all points on a simple closed surface together with all the interior points. So you remember the surfaces that we defined previously, a simple closed surface was hollow, whereas a solid is solid, okay? Polyhedron is a simple, so notice all this, is a simple closed surface made up of polygonal regions. Those are called faces. The vertices of the polygonal regions are the vertices of the polyhedron. So the original vertices of your polygon turn into the vertices of your polyhedron. The sides of the polygonal regions are called the edges of the polyhedron. Okay, we're going to see some of those now. All right, so we have polyhedra, just plural for polyhedron. Okay, now why, is, why are these two considered polyhedra and these four are not? Okay, let's go back to our definition again. Notice it's got to be simple, closed, and polygonal faces. Okay. So when you look at these two, they're both simple and closed. Okay, so it doesn't cross over itself. All right. And if you were to trace it out, this is, of course, three-dimensional. If you were to trace it out, you would start where you left off. Now, why is the sphere not considered a polyhedra? Because it doesn't have 
polygonal faces. Okay, same thing with this cylinder shape that's kind of pushed to its side. We already talked about this guy. He is not, he's not closed because he's got a hole in him. Okay, and this guy is not simple because it crosses over itself. So these four are not polyhedra, whereas these two are because they're simple, closed, and they have polygon faces. Now, let's define a prism. A prism is a polyhedron, like the guys we just talked about, in which two congruent faces, which are called the bases, those are in blue in our diagram here, lie in parallel planes, and the other faces, those are called the lateral faces, these are the ones in white, are bounded by parallelograms. Okay, so a prism, now a prism doesn't have to have a triangle as, a, as its base, it could have lots of different figures as its base, but we have rectangles as the sides. And then when you think about a prism, you might think about the, the piece of glass or crystal that you use to capture light and it sh shoots out a rainbow. That is really the shape of that kind of prism right here. But there are other kinds of prisms. Here you go. Um, notice it gives us more definitions. A right prism has lateral faces that are perpendicular to the bases. So notice that these three are all considered right prisms. Again, why? Because look, the, these lateral sides, they go straight up, but how do you define straight up? They make a 90 degree angle with the base, and it's not just this side, but this, this side and these sides. Okay, all 90 degree angles. All right, so again, these parallelograms, right, are rectangles, really, but the definitions are parallelograms. Why would I call these rectangles? Well, because it's a 90-degree angle right here and a 90-degree angle at the top. So if your bases meet your sides or your lateral faces with 90-degree angles, again, that is a right prism. But notice we have a triangle as the base for the first prism, a rectangle as the base for the second prism. Could you do it with a square? Absolutely. What about a hexagonal right prism? So we have a hexagon as the base. Again, it's right because the lateral sides meet the bases at a 90-degree angle. But then you could have an oblique prism, and the lateral faces are not perpendicular to the bases. What do you think that would do with the lateral faces? Would they be rectangles anymore? Hold that thought, okay? Hold that thought, and remember it when you do the homework problems. So this is a hexagonal. In other words, it's a, the bases are hexagons, but it's oblique. Notice how it's leaning. It looks like it's leaning to the left because... The lateral sides do not meet the base at a 90 degree angle. Next, let's define pyramids. Now, you might have thought about this before, but you know, pyramids could have different bases, right? So this is what looks like to be a triangular pyramid because the base is a triangle. But what about the pyramids in Egypt? Do they have a triangular base? Mm, no, they don't. They have a square base. And that's also called a pyramid. Well, the definition of a pyramid is simply a polyhedron determined by a polygon and a point not in the plane of the polygon. So there is no discussion whatsoever about the base. The base could be like the prism. It could be any shape that you want, okay, or any polygon shape. Let me be very clear about that. And a point, a single point that defines those lateral faces. So if you have a shape down here, and then it goes up to a point, wouldn't all the lateral faces be triangles? Seems like it would, right? Okay. Well, you could have a right pyramid where the lateral faces are congruent isosceles triangle. Now, notice that's different than the definition of a prism. A right prism, the bases meet the lateral sides at a 90-degree angle, or they're perpendicular. But this is a different definition. So um, a right pyramid, now the lateral faces are congruent isosceles triangles. Now what does that mean? It means all the triangles are the same. Okay, so they're congruent to each other. Isosceles, remember, means that two of the side lengths are congruent right here and right here. So those side lengths are congruent. The bottom one does not have to be the same size. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. 
Okay, and then all of the faces are congruent. Okay, so this is called a triangular pyramid. Again, that's if your base was a triangle. Of course, all three sides are going to be triangles. But this is a square pyramid, like in Egypt, all but flipped on its side, right? So you have a square base. Okay, and then again, that's why they have the pink lines here to denote that that's a square. But notice your four, you're going to have four sides for a square pyramid, right? These are congruent isosceles triangles, right? So all four of these triangles are congruent with two side lengths the same. Here's even a pentagonal pyramid, but which looks pretty cool. It's cool. So we have a pentagon at the bottom. And all five of our triangles, again, are congruent isosceles triangles. So all of these are right pyramids in this picture. Now this gets fun. If one or more corners of a polyhedron is removed by an intersecting plane or planes, so basically the thing gets chopped off, the polyhedron is a truncated, truncated let me say that properly, truncated polyhedron. So it looks like we took a pyramid right here and they just chopped it off. And see, you have a polygon that's left over as like the top. Okay, so this is a truncated square pyramid with parallel bases. Now, we didn't have to chop it off parallel, but what they mean by parallel bases is that this plane is parallel to this plane. Okay, now we could have just slid in at an angle and then we wouldn't have parallel bases anymore, right? Okay, check out this cube. We just took the corner off, which is right here. Highlighted in green, just poop, took the corner off. So that's a truncated cube. What about a truncated prism? Okay, notice this one, again, does not have parallel bases. We came slid in sideways and chopped the top out of this prism. What's the base of this prism? Notice how many sides it has, like one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a hexagon, all right? Well, a lot of polyhedron talk, we can have a convex polyhedron. Remember what convex means as far as a two-dimensional figure goes? Remember, it's considered convex if, I'm just going to draw you a random picture down here at the bottom. If I can draw from any point to point and stay inside. So that's considered convex, whereas this guy right here is not considered convex. It's concave. Because when I draw from one point to another, it comes out of the interior of the figure. Well, polyhedron can do the same thing. So a convex polyhedron is a polyhedron in which a segment connecting any two points in the interior of the polyhedron is in the interior of the polyhedron. So if you drew connected any two points inside this shape, it's the line stays inside the shape. Okay. Now, you could have a regular polyhedron, which is not the opposite of a convex polyhedron at all. This is just a different definition. A convex polyhedron whose faces are congruent, regular polygonal regions such that the number of the edges that meet each vertex is the same for all of the vertices of the polyhedron. Wow, that's a lot, right? Okay, so it's a convex polyhedron. That's why it's on the same page, because we had to define that first. Whose faces are congruent regular polygons. Okay, so regular polygon means each side of the polygon is congruent to every other side. Okay, so congruent regular polygons. And so this is saying all the faces are exactly the same shape, and each edge is exactly the same. They're congruent sides. Regions such that the number of edges that meet at each vertex is the same for all the vertices of the polyhedron. So each vertex looks exactly the same. Okay, now I've got some pictures for you. Okay, regular polyhedron. Notice a cube. Everybody knows what a cube is. Like it's a square. It's got six faces. Okay, um, let's talk about this. Let's just go into this real quick. So a cube, how many faces does it have? How many edges does it have? And how many vertices does it have? And we could do this for all of them or not, but I just want to speak the language. So a face, the lateral face, okay, well you have the two bases, right? The top and the bottom, that's two. And then the lateral faces is one, two, three, four. 
So four lateral faces and then the two bases. So that's six total faces. How about edges? Okay, so let's count. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I think I got them all. Let me tell you how, how much easier it is that I can just draw right on top of this figure. That helps a lot. And then vertices, these are our corners, right? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then back here, the one we can't see, eight. So eight vertices. And being able to discuss the number of faces, edges, and vertices is really important for classifying polyhedra. So a tetrahedron, you see it here, it's all triangles, looks like equilateral triangles. How many sides does it have? Notice you don't see any of the dashed lines here. So you got one, two, three, and then on the back side, four. Okay, so four faces. You could count the edges. You could count the vertices. There's an octahedron. That's fun. This also appears to be equilateral because it said it had to be regular polygon faces. So all I can have is a square or an equilateral triangle, right? So here's an equilateral triangle connected differently than the tetrahedron. Okay, why do you think they call that an octahedron? How many faces does it have? A whole, okay. Flipping over, a dodecahedron. Now, what's the face of a dodecahedron? So, check this out. That's a pentagon, right? So, one, two, three, four, five sides. That's a pentagon. And you connect them up and you get a dodecahedron. This is really cool. And then a casahedron, okay. Look, that is, we're back to an equilateral triangle. It would be really hard to count all the faces there, but you could do it. If you had to do it, I know you could do it. Now, it would seem that this would be infinite, that regular polyhedron, you could just keep making them up and making them up and connecting these and always possible. This is not the case. So, I want to pull you an excerpt out of the textbook, and we're going to talk about it. So, regular polyhedra. Remember, this is a dodecagon that I've got in the corner up here for you. Just something to visually help you think about this. It says, how many different regular polyhedra are there? Again, it's not infinity. At first thought, you thought, oh my goodness, there's so many ways we could combine these together. But no, 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 there's not. So, first we're going to understand the problem. Remember these steps? This is way back in chapter one at the very beginning of solving mathematical problems. So, or any problem, really, understanding the problem. It says each face of a regular polyhedron is congruent to each of the other faces of the polyhedron. And each face is bounded by a regular polygon. We are to find the number of different regular polyhedra. So again, this is reminding you of the definition of a regular polyhedra, that all of the faces are the same and they are regular polygons. Okay, so we're going to devise a plan. The sum of the measures of all the angles of the faces at a vertex of a regular polyhedron must be less than 360 degrees. Okay, let's break down what in the world they're saying right here. Okay, so they're saying at a vertex. Look, right here. I've got it highlighted in purple for you. Purple is not a good color. Let's go green. Still not good, but you see it right there. Okay, so that's considered a vertex. Now, if we combine, just picture different shapes for this one, three hexagons together or more. Okay, we'll talk about that. But if you put those together, it says... It must be less than 360 degrees. And then I'm here to ask you why. Why would that sum of those angles be less than 360 degrees? Well, let's think about it. What if it was exactly 360 degrees? Then it would lay flat. Do you see what I'm saying? It would fill the whole circle. All the degrees would be there. It would lay flat. So there's no way to make a three-dimensional figure that way. What if it was over 360 degrees? then stuff would overlap, right? And that would not give you a regular polyhedra. So you need that sum to be less than 360 degrees, okay? It goes on to say, we examine the measures of the interior angles of regular polygons to determine which of the polygons could be faces of a regular polyhedron. 
We then try to determine how many types of polyhedra there are. Okay, so that's that's the plan. We're just we know that it has to add to less to be less than 360 when we add our sides together. Again, because that's what's going to make a three-dimensional shape. Over 360, you would have to overlap the sides. Um, exactly 360, you would have a flat figure, and it would not give you a three-dimensional shape. All right, so we're going to start looking at different polygons to see what might work out. It says, carrying out the plan, we determine the size of an angle of some regular polygons as shown in Table 13. That's coming, I promise. Could a regular heptagon, remember how many sizes does a heptagon have? Seven, yes, yeah, seven. Be a face of a regular polyhedron. It says at least three figures must fit together at a vertex to make a polyhedron. Why would that be? Why would it take at least three figures to fit together to make a polyhedra shape? Well, picture if you had two that fit together, they would just flatten on each other and you wouldn't have any space inside. Okay, so you're going to have to have at least three to have an interior to your polyhedron. Does that make pretty good sense? Okay, if three angles of a regular heptagon are together at one vertex, then the sum of the measures of these angles would be, okay, now how do you figure out the sum of the measures of the angles? Remember, it's n minus 2, so 7 minus 2 is 5, times 180 degrees, that gives you all the sum of the angles in this seven-sided polygon. We multiply it by three because there's going to be three figures, right? At least three. So you see three in this picture right here. Three fit together. It has to be at least three. And then we divide by seven because there are seven different vertices of that. You've done this calculation already. I hope you've already done the homework for the previous section because you need that thought to do it. Or maybe two previous sections. Anyway. So that is bigger than 360 degrees. You know what that means? That means that a heptagon is not going to make a regular polyhedra. It's out. A seven-sided figure is totally gone. So similarly, more than three angles cannot be used at a vertex. Thus, a heptagon cannot be used to make a regular polyhedron. Now, why did they say more than three angles? Because three is the minimum, right? We checked three. That's what this three right here was for doing three figures. If we up it to four, it's definitely not going to work because that's going to be even greater than 360 than we what we had before. So here is a list of regular polygons, right? Would a triangle work? Well, remember a triangle has an interior angle of 60 degrees. So if we multiplied three of them together, that would be three times 60 degrees. That equals 180 degrees. Yep, that seems like that might work out pretty good. What about a square? Well, we put three of them together times 90 degrees. That would give us 270 degrees, right? You could even do four of those things. And that would be, or could you do four? Hmm. What is four times 90? Well, four times 90, we know it's 360 degrees, right? Will that work? No. Remember, it, we, we wouldn't have a shape at all. It wouldn't be three-dimensional. It would be flat. Okay. Could we do four triangles? That would be four times 60 degrees. That would be 240 degrees. Hey, that's an option too. So three triangles might be an option. Four triangles might be an option. Three to make three squares might be an option. What about a pentagon? Well, a pentagon is 108 degrees. What is 108 times three? I get 324. Hey, folks, that might be an option here. So we could have three sides for a pentagon. What about a hexagon? So what is three times 120? Because each side of a hexagon is 120 degrees. I'm sorry, vertex of a hexagon is 120 degrees. That would be 360 degrees. Uh-oh. That's not going to work out, right? We want it to bad. But if it's 360, it's going to lay flat, y'all. It's not going to have a curve at all. And you can't force it, okay? It's got to be what it is. And a heptagon, we've already decided, nope, that's off the list, right? So you know what? That's what gives us our list. So look, here's our list. You have a triangle. You could do three sides or four sides. The three sides is a tetrahedron. The four sides is an octahedron. Cool, right? 
What about five sides? You know, I didn't even check the triangle with five sides. It should have because five times 60 is 300. And that gives us the icosahedron, which is a super cool looking figure. And then we talked about the square, which we can only do three sides. 90 times 3 is 270. That gives us the cube. And the pentagon, remember, that that was that worked, right? 3 times 108 was 324. You put that thing together and you get a, a dodecahedron, which is just a cool-looking figure. Now, next we wanted to find something called a net. And you might have played with something like this before. It says these patterns can be used to construct the five regular polyhedra. Now, you, you need to picture this in your mind, right? Here is your square. You remember how many faces the cube had? We counted them. It was one, two, three, four, five, six faces. I'm sure you could visually see. So, so this is like cardstock, right? And you cut this out. And the dash lines, you don't cut those, those are perforated lines. So you just bend your figure along those lines, and then you fold it up, and boom, you have a cube. A tetrahedron, again, is a big triangle, and then you can fold along the dash lines, and you're going to have a tetrahedron. The octahedron, here you go. I know you can look at this. You can read this yourself. Dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. A cosahedron. I struggle with that. Every time I read it, I have to refigure my letters to get it out. The icosahedron, which is awesome looking, right? So these are called nets. These are like two dimensional figures that, when cut out and folded, will give you those three dimensional polyhedrons. Now, not all three dimensional shapes are polyhedrons, okay? So, cylinders and cones are not. A cylinder is a simple closed surface. So, remember what closed means, right? Okay, so if you were to draw this, you would start and stop at the same point, okay? A simple closed surface that is not a polyhedron formed as a segment AB parallel to a given line L traces a planar curve other than a polygon. So, basically, you have a base, okay? And then you have a defined line L right here. And then, notice it says parallel to a given line L. If you trace all these possible lines that are parallel to L, then that's going to shape out the edge. It's like a soup can, so a cylinder here. All right, now here we go again. But this is an oblique cylinder. Remember, oblique doesn't meet at a 90-degree angle, whereas a right does meet at a 90-degree angle down here at the bottom. But here's our line L, and then we trace out a bunch of parallel lines, an infinite number, all around this base, which is circular. And that's, excuse me, going to give us an oblique cylinder. Okay, check out this dude over here. <laughs> we do not have a circle at the bottom. It's some amoeba-shaped situation. But that still gives us a cylinder. It's, ev it's still defined to be a cylinder. It's oblique because it doesn't meet your base at a 90-degree angle. But you can still trace out all those parallel lines to line L. That's going to make your side, okay? And then you notice your base on the top and the bottom matches. Okay, so cylinders don't have to be pretty. They can be all crazy looking as long as it meets the definition. Ha, now we have a cone. So what's the difference between a cylinder and a cone? Well, a cylinder has the base on the top and the bottom. But when you have a cone, you remember a cone was defined as a single point up there. Now, the distance from the point to the base is called the altitude. Okay? And then you have the lateral surface. That's the outside that gets traced around. Okay, and then your vertex is the point at the top, point P, and this is a right circular cone. And what makes it right, notice what's going on here, is the altitude. So the altitude meets the base, this line right here meets the base at a 90 degree angle. And that's what that's telling you right there. But a cone meets at one point, whereas a cylinder, you have a base on the top and the bottom. Okay, so does it have to be a circular cone? Well, absolutely not. Um, this is oblique, so the altitude does not meet at a 90 degree angle, okay, and you could argue that you really don't even have an altitude here. Um, and it's, it's not, well, it doesn't meet at a 90 degree angle, 
okay? And also, you're not circular at the base. That doesn't have anything to do with oblique, because you can have, there you go, you can have an oblique circular cone. That's what's happening here. But this doesn't even have a circular base, and it's oblique because, again, you can't draw an altitude straight from P to meet your base and hit a 90 degree angle. Matter of fact, the altitude for this thing, I, don't, I said it doesn't have an altitude, but you might be able to do this. Okay, there's your 90 degree angle, and it doesn't even fit with inside the cone. So that's what makes it oblique, okay? All right, so, um, yeah, I think that wraps that up. I have a homework problem for you. So you've defined cylinders, cones, polyhedra. Let's talk about a homework example. All right, so you know I picked some homework problems. And here we go. So I ran across this one and I thought I've either got to get rid of it or I've got to help you out a little bit because it can be a little bit overwhelming. So it says a soccer ball resembles a polyhedron with 32 faces made up of 20 regular hexagons and 20 regular pentagons. So notice it's not a regular polyhedron because a regular polyhedron has the same shape. Uh, for every single face. So this one's made up of hexagons and pentagons, specifically 12 hexagons and 12 pentagons. And they want to know how many vertices there are. Now, before you go grab a soccer ball, hey, which is an option, and I highly encourage it. I don't have one. I have a volleyball. I don't have a soccer ball. So I've got to think this through, right? The first thing I want to do is just look at one. So I found one. Here you go. It's called a truncated icosahedron is the word I, I can't pronounce. I have to reorganize it every time. So notice what's going on here. So you'll notice that we've got a hexagon here and then a pentagon here. So for every pentagon, there's two hexagons. So it makes this cool flower shape over here on the side where you have a pentagon and then hexagon, 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 hexagon all the way around. And then there's another pentagon. And that connects up and that makes a soccer ball. So one option is you just could count the vertices. Likely that's not what they had in mind here. But, but you could count the vertices. Go grab your soccer ball. You probably have to maybe, the idea is maybe put a piece of tape on every one of them that you count. Because it's going to be real hard to keep up with which ones you've counted and which ones you haven't counted. But that's an option. And that might even be fun for students to do. The more I think about this, this could be really a whole lot of fun. But what it comes down to is something called Euler's formula. And that this is a very prolific mathematician, Leonard Euler. That's not pronounced Euler. It's pronounced Euler. At least that's what I've always been told. And really, he was not the one to first find it. Ray, Rene Descartes found it first. But it's actually called Euler's formula. Now, let me explain what this is. V is the number of vertices. Okay, cool. That's what we're looking for right? F is the number of faces, and E is the number of edges. Okay, so some of this information we know, and some of it we don't know, but we know if we add V plus F and subtract the edges, the answer is 2, all of the time, every time, no matter what your regular polyhedron is, and it actually works for this truncated icosahedron, which is a soccer ball. So we're looking for V. That's the ultimate goal is to find V. That's what we want to know. What do we know? Hey, we know how many faces it has. It even says there's 32 faces. And the 32 faces are made with 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. So for faces, we're going to plug in 32. We've got that. We're looking for vertices, right? We're still missing something. We need edges, right? The edges. Now, here's what I want you to imagine. Every edge goes to two different figures. Every single edge is connecting two different figures, every one of them. So what if, what if we took our 20 regular hexagons, and multiplied that by, how many sides does a hexagon have, y'all? Six. Okay. And then divide that by two because every one of them meets up. It's 
every edge is two different figures. That's why I'm dividing by two. So 20 times 6 is 120. 120 divided by 2 is 60. That's your hexagons. Okay. Well, what about the pentagons? Okay. The pentagons, there are what, 12? There's 12 of those things. All right. How many sides does the pentagon have? Five. And then we're going to divide that by two again because it meets up one edge goes with two different figures, okay? So 12 times 5 is 60. 60 divided by 2 is 30. So the argument would be there are 60 plus 30, which is 90 edges. 90 edges. There we go. Hey, you know what? Now we can use that Euler's formula. So I have V plus F, which is 32, minus edges, which is 90, and that's supposed to equal 2. Okay, so let's like terms. V minus, what's 32 minus 90? That's 58. 58 equals 2. And to solve for V, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add 58 to both sides, plus 58, plus 58. I'm running out of room. Okay, so I get V is equal to, there it is, 60. So there are 60 vertices. Two ways to go, the way I just did it. Or um, you could get out the soccer ball and start taping it up and counting all the vertices. I think you should do both. Okay. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope this homework problem helped you out and the rest of them are not so uh, brain strangling. Have a great one. Bye.